your spurn, and it's still plenty of fuel, you can still see it on there. Once you cover somebody in that gel, there's no escaping it, it sticks to things and it burns, and there's just going to be one mobile fireball. Scott has designed the perfect tunica molester. But how would it work on its victim, and just how spectacular would it be? To find out, Scott is going to test his design on a real person, stuntman Steve Trulia. I think the most distressing thing about doing a full body burn as a stunt performer is that the fear wells up from inside you. It's a primeval fear. You feel as though you want to panic, scream, shout, run about, and part of our skill is to try and control that. Steve is preparing for his full body burn. He's wearing five layers of fire-resistant clothing, but no material is completely fireproof. The naphtha gel has not been used on a human being for thousands of years, and once it is alight, it's totally uncontrollable. See the thumbs up if you're happy. welling up inside of the flames in front of my face. Um, I can't imagine what that must be like for somebody that's really being burned. It doesn't bear thinking about someone being in just a, just a tunic. I think wanting to get the flames out of your face is the most important thing there. That's the, that's the primeval urge. I think anyone being burnt with a tunic or molester will have been running, I would think, almost anything uh, to get your face out of those flames. On that burn, the uh, flames went so high, so quickly, that it surprised me. It's a sudden, full-size fireball. There's no build-up, it's just wallop, taking everybody by surprise. The test proves that it is possible to create a large fireball that will last for up to a minute, an agonizing spectacle. That felt different from most of the stunt burns that I do, because I've been really aware since this job came in that this was really done to people. And I was aware of that throughout this, the whole tunica molester process. Um, so it felt different. It was more poignant in a way. And uh, it's made me quite pensive and thoughtful about the whole process. Whipping was a common form of punishment in the ancient world. The whip is and always has been a very, very effective device for, um, for um, causing pain for, for either punishment or for torture. The very simplicity of it is one of its great attributes. It was never more popular than in the Roman Empire. The Romans seemed to favour whipping. You know, famously, we think about Jesus Christ being flogged on his way to the cross. Flogging was a very, very usual form of, of punishment. This popularity led to developments in the technology of the whip, and the most fearsome of all was the scorpion. This has actually got metal attachments on the end which are hooked, and these are actually sharpened. So this is going to be a really very nasty device. If these hook into the flesh and they're snatched back, you know, one would imagine that these are going to cause quite significant injury. Could it rip skin, clean off the human back, or even cut down to the bone? Within the Roman Empire, punishment could only be administered under strict laws. There were special rules passed which um, only permitted a maximum of 40 strokes. It was a punishable offence to administer more than 40 lashes. Exceeding 40 strokes risked accidental death. What was often done, they would only actually inflict 39, so any errors of counting and then still be on the safe side. To discover what 39 scorpion lashes could do to flesh, Richard Windley will be joined by trauma surgeon Mike Edwards. They will test the effect of the whip on a pig carcass. Pig flesh is a close representation of human flesh because the skin and tissues are similar in both species. Richard administers 39 lashes of the scorpion. The pig's flesh will not show bruising or bleeding because it's not living tissue. 
but it will reveal the physical effects of the tearing. Right, well, we can see here that there are lots of lots of little, about one centimeter lacerations. And here you can see this is quite a deep laceration. Yes. You can see from the, the structure of this hook here what the effect would have been as this thing had engaged. It would have stuck in the tissues and then as you pulled it out, it would have ripped. If this were a living um, being, presumably this would be covered in blood by now. Oh yes, each one of these little, the little cuts you can see here would undoubtedly be bleeding. This would be red raw. But the law restricting the flogging to 39 lashes did not apply to everyone. Those condemned to crucifixion could be whipped until close to death. So what would happen if the scorpion was used for more than 39 lashes? You probably would have uh, started tugging the skin off. I think the chances are you could even be whipping down to the bone with something like this, and you'd be tearing the uh, strips of flesh off the ribs. This was the fate of thousands of men and women that were crucified under the Roman Empire. Before being hung on a cross, they endured countless strikes that cut into the bone. Another form of cruel punishment was used centuries later in medieval Europe, when the penalty, it was believed, should fit the crime. If the sin had been lying or blasphemy, the appropriate sentence was the pair of anguish. The pair is an insult, it's an assault on the human body. Our mouths are used in breathing, in eating, in communication, and the pair violates all of those. It was a device forged from iron, and it consisted of four petals secured around a central thread. Closed, it resembled a pear in size and shape, but as the handle was twisted, the petals slowly opened. It expanded outwards, extending its width threefold. A number of them still exist, but there are no surviving accounts of what this implement actually did to the human body. Ancient discoveries will investigate not only whether the pear could rip the mouth apart, but also whether the terror and injury it inflicted could lead to cardiac arrest. Forensic dentist Dr. Catherine Adams will analyze the effects of the pair of anguish on the mouth. The torture is, in many respects, the sheer horror of what this is going to do. Something is going to be inserted against your will into your mouth. The first obstacle to the torturer is going to be the teeth. The sheer weight of this is likely to actually fracture some of the teeth. The teeth are supplied by a massive number of nerve receptors, so the damage would cause immense pain. Once the pair is in, the idea was then to actually open it up so that the leaves would be expanding the jaw. They would be resting on the inner surfaces of the teeth and pushing those further and further apart. Eventually, the teeth would be forced from their sockets. If you've ever had a tooth extracted in the dentist, you know that the nerves will have been anaesthetized. But imagine having that without an anaesthetic. As the pair expands, what will happen is that the jaw will actually dislocate. Compounding this, there will be swelling at the back of the mouth, and it is possible that the airway could start to close over. The obstruction in the mouth, the shock and the constriction of the windpipe would make breathing more and more difficult. This would lead to hypoxia, a reduced level of oxygen in the blood. The hypoxia is going to have significant effects on the rest of the body. The major organs will be starved of oxygen, in particular the brain, and eventually what that will do after a, a couple of minutes is that it's going to cause cardiac arrest. During this medieval period, the Inquisition sentenced thousands to be burnt at the stake. But did these victims actually die from burning? Or was death caused by inhaling the flame itself? Medieval Europe was subjected to the Inquisition's reign of terror. 
the Inquisition was established by the Roman Catholic Church to crush opposition from heretics. Those found guilty of religious beliefs that opposed Catholicism were believed to have sinned against God and the Church. Thousands of people were sentenced to death. Burning them was considered a mercy. It was believed that through the fires, a kind of taste of the fires of hell, there was the smallest chance that the victim might actually be able to receive redemption um, and salvation. It was the authorities trying to give them a chance at an eternal afterlife in heaven rather than consigned to the eternal flames of hell. Many historical texts still exist that describe the final moments of these victims. But there remains a fundamental mystery. How did fire actually kill people on the stake? Did they slowly burn to death, or did they die by inhaling the flame itself? In 1555, the Reverend John Hooper, Bishop of Gloucester, was burnt at the stake for refusing to convert from the Church of England to Catholicism. It was said that he slowly burnt to death while remaining conscious, and prayed even as his face blackened from the flames. An eyewitness account provides clues as to how he died. But even when his face was completely black with the flames and his tongue swelled, yet his lips went till they were sunk to the gums. And he knocked his breast with his hands. This holy martyr was more than three quarters of an hour consuming. But can a human body actually remain alive for 45 minutes in such a situation? It takes less time for him to die but probably the time for the whole body to be consumed would be around 45 minutes. I think it's more likely that his lips appeared to be moving because the uh, heat was causing the, um, the skin to retract and the lips moved as they became more burnt. When people burn, uh, their joints contract and I would envisage that him beating his breast would be uh, his elbows contracting and his hands striking his chest. The observation was correct, but they've been interpreted in a way that wasn't quite appropriate. Mick Flanagan, the senior fire investigator of the South Wales Fire Service, is investigating this punishment to determine the exact cause of death. Fire can at attack you in two ways, by burning and by flame inhalation. Heat can be so great that it causes charring to the outer layers of the skin until eventually it goes beyond the live skin to the internal organs. A second way is if you inhale flame, the flames will then scorch and burn the air passages and the air passages will then swell and close up, thereby stopping you from breathing. Mick has erected three types of stake most commonly used in the executions. One has timbers to head height, another is surrounded by a ring of firewood, and the third has wood around its base. This is the type of stake that the Reverend John Hooper is believed to have died on. To determine cause of death, Mick will monitor the height of the flames and the temperature on each stake. If the temperature exceeds 60 degrees centigrade or 140 degrees Fahrenheit for more than 15 minutes, he will know that the victim died from burning. If the flames reach head height on the stake before this, the victim would have died from inhaling the flames. Almost immediately, there is a reading from one of the stakes. Because of the angle of the timbers on stake one, the flames have shot straight up to the level of where we've placed our sensors on the stake. They would be engulfed in flame really, really quickly. And that means they would have inhaled flame, and in inhaling the flames, that would quickly have brought about their death. If someone were to inhale flames, then what would be damaged would be the lining of the respiratory tree. If the throat is damaged by increased local heat, then it will swell up and it can actually stop you taking in air and getting it down to the lungs. 